Jeff Goodby is the co-founder of Goodby Silverstein Partners in San Francisco. He is a mastermind within the world of advertising. His work is, it's, you've seen it, everything from the Got Milk campaign in the 90s to five commercials in the Super Bowl this past weekend, five for brands like Pepsi, Doritos, Sam Adams. It is, their, their work has been featured, obviously, in Super Bowl commercials, but also in museums. It's uh, his own personal work as an illustrator has been featured within Time Magazine and um, and a few other outlets that uh, that really still only scratches the surface of the impact Jeff has had in the creative world. Uh, it is one of my favorite episodes that I've done to date. You'll see why as we get into it. Just such an expansive career um, and such a, a generous creative mind sharing what he's learned over the years. So without further ado, let's get into it with Jeff Goodby. This is Below the Line. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. This is great. Thank you for having me. This is going to be a a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to this episode. Um, You're almost like a meta creator in that you are a founder. You are uh, a creative yourself but you also have managed insanely creative people and creative projects in your career. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. But first up, uh, cheers to you, a little digital cheers. Yeah, what as you, well. What are you drinking? What are you on drinking? Ah, I was about to ask you. I'm drinking. Yeah, what do you got? I'm drinking a LaCroix, unfortunately. You know what? I, I quit drinking for January. So what's happened over the last few days is that I've been thinking about having wine at lunchtime. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's around lunchtime right now. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. I think it's bad, bad for my uh, my image. But yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm having. What are you having? Work from home, you know. No one will know. But yeah, slippery slope. This is a uh, tapache, which is put it up for the screen for viewers. It is a. It's kind I of. I know like, that stuff. Really, you do. How yeah, do you How do you know hip. of it? Very hip people. People at work telling me about it. That's what happens. Yeah. You know? Hang out with people like you. That's what happens. No, it's I can't imagine what the office is uh, for you all. It just how how hit that's that's next level hip uh, water cooler talk. This is um, yeah, this is tapache, which is essentially like a, it's pineapple fermented uh, version of kombucha instead of kombucha kind of which is you know a little bitter. This is sweet, and uh, mm. this is a cool company here in. LA called De La Calle. Um, and listeners know that there's always a random drink on, on each episode. So this is this episode's random drink. De my La, daughter De La Calle. is the one that told me about that. Yeah, really? I mean, it's my daughter who told me about that. She's like a kombucha special, you know, PhD oh, in nice. kombucha. Well, this stuff, I, I could never stomach it, but this stuff is really great. It tastes better and it has all of the probiotics of everything that, you know, the functional reasons to drink kombucha. But enough about uh, drinks. Um, although that hit brands, this will be a theme that comes back in this episode and conversation over and over again. But, uh, just to kick things off, um, you are in, where are you right now? Um, I'm in Oakland, California right now. I work, you know, if I go to the office ever, it's in San Francisco on California street. It's like a cliche of what my clients expect when they come to my office. It's, a uh, Big brick building, six stories on California Street on a hill like that in San Francisco with cable cars going up and down. It's a cliche. And how, and you, but you little, go ahead. Little walk to Chinatown, little walk up the hill to Knob Hill, lots of places to eat. You know, I mean, I miss it. I've only been there twice since March, you know. Really? Sad. Just say, yeah, it's it's just completely, especially San Francisco, certainly. you know, shutting things down more than most cities um, for good reason. Does does the um, but real quick, actually not real quick. The podcast allows for long form. Tell listeners and myself how you found yourself to San Francisco and Oakland because you're not from there. No, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and you know my parents are um, still there. They're 95 years old. Amazing people. Awesome. <laughs> they're they're still plugging along. Um, they, uh, you know, my dad was a insurance guy 
in Providence and my mother was born in Italy and she is a painter. So I kind of got like a business and an art thing from the, the beginning. And my mother took me to art, you know, museums and taught me to paint and draw and so on. I've never really been formally trained in art, but I'm, I'm pretty good at it actually. And um, like I can paint and I've done a lot of printing and so on, largely because of my mom. And um, went on from there, went to college at Harvard in Cambridge and uh, uh, met my wife there. And she's from California, Southern California. Mm. She didn't like living in Boston. I worked as a newspaper reporter in Boston for a while and she didn't like living in Boston. So uh, I told her, you know, that I, well, I tried living in Los Angeles and I didn't like it very much. Um, and I think about largely because of my work, I didn't really click with a place to work there. So I went back to Boston. And what work were you doing in and, LA and then back in Boston? In, in LA, I was, uh, I was writing and illustrating actually drawing for um, magazines and newspapers in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. LA Times, LA Express, um, LA Times Magazine, things like that. <clears throat> and also national things like Time Magazine and Mother Jones. So I was drawing for, for a living then, which is crazy. It's hard work. I mean, I loved it, but it was really hard work. Do you mind giving um, listeners but, just a little bit of when you say it's hard work, what goes through your mind? It seems uh, to someone that doesn't, I, I don't know, idyllic to just sit there, draw, but uh, walk me through. Yeah, what the problem mind. is you don't, you're not just sitting there and drawing. You have, you're at the same time um, working to get the next job. <laughs> so, you know, you, you're, you're, you're calling people up. You were bringing your portfolio and dropping it off at places. And in those days, you know, this is in, in the late seventies, early eighties, you are, um, you're slug, you know, you're, 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 you're slogging your portfolio physically into places in LA and New York to, uh, to show things. And so it's a lot of physical work and, you know, then you're worried about who's going to call you up and so on. But when you finally get the call, sometimes it's a lot of fun. You know, people would call me up and go, we have an article about lung cancer. Can you illustrate it? And it'd be like, uh, sure, I'll think of something. Come on. So it was it was kind of fun in that regard. It was very creative. And, you know, the stuff that I did was really a lot of fun to think about. Um, so that, that was good for me. And when I went back to Boston, I worked again in newspapers, but I drew as well back there. And my and my wife wanted to move back to California. So I didn't want to move to LA at the time. And I said, the only place I can stand in California is San Francisco actually. And so she, uh, she said, okay, let's try San Francisco. So we drove to San Francisco and hung out. And, uh, actually I looked around for a newspaper job, couldn't get one. So I started thinking about what I could do instead. And, um, and, you know, when I was in college, am, is, am I going on too long? No, here? no, this is, no. Know, this, this is what, what this is what I love. Um, I mean, this is the below the line. Ver I want the long form version for sure. This is below the line, man. Yeah. Um, you know, so we, we, we were literally in, I mean, you know, again, a cliche, literally in a Volkswagen bus camped out up in, uh, in Olima, north of San Francisco in a campground. And I would come into the city and like interview at places. Okay. So I decided... You know, when I was in college, I liked looking at design magazines and so, you know, like print and communication arts. And I used to see advertising in there and I go like, some of these ads are pretty cool, you know, like they're, they're, they have a lot of respectability, big, big budget kind of visuals, commercial shoots. Um, and, and the writing at some of those places like Doyle Dane Bernbach for Volkswagen in those days was pretty great. You know, it was like the way that you kind of thought about products in your own head and um, what, what would be an example then, that that comes to mind sort of, from from back then just to build that out for oh, listeners like uh probably the listeners are too young for a lot of this stuff but there were there was a very famous um, volkswagen campaign when i was in college done in new york by doyle dane called um it had ads like think small with a volkswagen you yeah. know bug in it or you know, um, lemon and it talked about, you know, how they had quality control of their stuff. Uh, they had a famous campaign for Avis rent cars that said, um, you know, we're number two in rent a car. So we try harder than 
than number one <laughs> and things like that. Like I like I like the wit of that stuff. And um, so I started looking around for an advertising job and I was showing my drawings and my writings for newspapers. And finally, Charles Martel, uh, the creative director at McCann Erickson in San Francisco said, you, you know, you're going to have to go home and like write some advertising and you're not going to get a job with this portfolio you've got. Like, it, it's great. I like looking at it and reading it, but I, I just can't imagine advertising. So so I went back to my mother-in-law's farm in Southern California and sat around drinking beer and wrote ads for a couple of weeks. And uh, I came back up to San Francisco. I got I got a job right away. Um, mm. So, you know, and he said to me, if you don't like the process of doing this, you're not going to like working in this business. Um, so I, I did have a good time writing those ads. You know, I had I made up I made up uh, campaigns to work on. I picked things that I liked and made believe I was working on those, and I picked things that I didn't like and I fixed their campaigns and so what, on. Was it more fun than the the journalistic approach to illustration and you know and reporting? It wasn't more fun than illustrating, but it was way more fun than reporting to me, just mm -hmm. because. It was unfettered, you know. I didn't have to worry about the truth as much, um, and uh, it was kind of, you know, it was very liberating in that sense. Right. So I got a job at J. Walter Thompson like immediately, and as somebody said to me, you know, they just got the Standard Oil account, the Chevron account in California, so they could afford to hire, you know, an idiot like me and you know fire me if they needed to. It was one of those days when I walked in, which was great. Um, and so I worked there and, you know, it, it was really a good place for me. This is a little life lesson. It probably wasn't the best agency in the world at the time, but the people there were really smart and fun to hang around with and exciting. And the work wasn't all that great. So I got to work on things that were way over my head pretty quickly. And if I screwed them up, for the most part, people didn't notice, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so I learned a lot. And that's that's actually a good thing early in life is to is to kind of work at a place that's, you know, it's going to give you opportunities like you don't have to get your first job or your first uh, opportunity at the best place in the world. You know, I mean, right. sometimes it's good to get it at a place that's not quite the best. In Almost the world. like a sandbox to play around in before a sandbox before yeah. the big leagues. Yeah. Yeah. And having a sandbox sort of frees your mind up a little bit too, you know, like, cause standards can be really terrifying mm -hmm. <laughs> in general, you know? So it's, I mean, you know, my own agency presently, I'd have to say it's a hard place to be a junior, you know, it's terrifying because it's just, you know, you look up the, the ladder and go, whoa. Whereas at this place, I was like looking up the ladder going, I could do that. So that was good. Um, the, that that reminds me of an experience that I when I moved to San Francisco I moved there for this uh, this incubator program for my startup called Y Combinator, and it's it's a really well known incubator. One of the best parts about it, it they gave great advice. They had great um, tactical reasons to be a part of it. But the best I'd say the best part of it was just being able to be in a room, see a hundred other founders, kind of see what the landscape of other creators. Of my you know ilk and uh, were like and see kind of where i i fit in didn't fit in and and but ultimately felt really empowered by okay instead of only knowing the stories of like the titans i get to look to my left and right and see um that i i, I can belong that it, yeah that, to your point that i felt like okay i could do this but coming from austin texas i was like i don't know if i can hang in the bay area well, I can do this is a really important thing to have in your head, you know, I mean, and somebody will give you that or the the environment, your context, your world will give you that at some point. And if, if it does, you're very lucky. <laughs> you know? Did you um, did you feel like coming from Harvard, extremely prestigious university and then um, kind of bouncing around? What was did you ever feel like, man, I'm I'm, I'm freaking behind where I should be? Or with my with you know with your peer set, or did that not enter your 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 mind? And maybe that was a superpower if it didn't. Well, I didn't I didn't really measure myself against people that went to law school or medical school or traditional professional 
ways to succeed because I thought of myself as a creative person. You know, I was on the Harvard Lampoon and I knew people there that went on to write at SNL and things like that. So, oh, awesome. I mean, those are the people I was hanging around with. And that kind of person generally dicks around after college and has no idea okay, what they're so doing. Had, like, that's you had what press, I did. Yeah, precedent. Yeah. <laughs> That's so that's what I did, and yeah. uh, that's what my friends were doing. So I didn't really feel like I was behind, behind anybody <laughs> in this process. Yeah. Uh, we were all doing the same thing. So I, anyway, I um, I worked at this one place and did something. Came up with an animated campaign that for Chevron that had like dinosaurs in the gas tank that would like stick their heads out and talk and stuff. And you know, gasoline is made of dead dinosaurs in the mm -hmm. beginning you know dinosaurs die they get crushed they turn into shale oil and get you know, so you know they become gasoline and so we invented these these dinosaurs that are in the gas tank of your car that would talk to you mm -hmm. and it, it was funny and uh probably the best creative director in san francisco for sure but maybe in the country hal reiney at ogilvy and mather saw this campaign and called me up and asked me to come over and talk to him. And at that point, like my standards went way up. Like, you know, I could no longer, this guy was really good mm -hmm. and I could no longer get away with like learning. I, I couldn't, I couldn't like blow something anymore. I had to actually make sure that everything came out really good, which was, it was great. So I went from a place where I could experiment to a place where kind of couldn't experiment anymore i had to really like nail it every time how many and, years uh, how many years in that uh metaphorical sandbox before you were called called up sandbox was really only like two and a half years mm -hmm. and maybe two years and then at Riney, two really two years as well um and i you know i i i think it was five years in all before i started my own company so mm -hmm. you know it was five years of various sandbox work and um, the second sandbox was, as I say, the, the standards were so much higher. Like I remember being in, in Hal's office, he's a very intimidating kind of Ernest Hemingway like character and presence. Um, and he uh, was on the phone with one of his friends and the friend had obviously asked him what he was doing today. And Hal said, uh, just trying to make some of the best fucking advertising in the whole world. And he looked like right into my eyes as he said that. And I was like, <laughs> this guy's not kidding, you know? <laughs> what so, what uh, was your what was your perception of that of uh invigorated, uh, kind of like what the hell is going on? Um well, that, that, it was everything at once, dude. Yeah. It was like frightening, invigorating, challenging, um, all at once. So uh -huh. You know, it definitely, it definitely upped my standards of what had to happen. And um, and while I was there, I was very lucky that he um, he stuck me with my current partner, Rich Silverstein, to uh, to work on a a baseball pitch actually for the Oakland A's. And um, and the A's had just hired Billy Martin as their manager, who was like this fiery weirdo who had great success everywhere, but for the most part would burn out after two or three years because he was, he would, you know, abuse an umpire or say the wrong thing to the owner of the team or just do something, uh, you know, drink too much, drank a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, so we got assigned to work on this and the A's, the Oakland A's who had just hired this guy as their, as their manager um, had, they didn't have a good team at all. The only thing they had going for them was Billy Martins. And I said, you know, you got to use Billy in the advertising. And they said, no, no, we can't take a chance and use him in the advertising. It's terrible. Can't happen. You know, he'll, he'll, he's going to blow up and do something wrong. And um, he, uh, he actually started succeeding while we were doing this camp, coming up with a campaign. He was doing such a good job. And Hal said to me, you know, you got to use Billy. They got nothing else. And I said, well, you know, Hal was not a baseball fan. And at some point I mentioned to him that the sports writers around San Francisco called Billy Martin's brand of baseball, Billy ball. So I said that word to Hal and Hal said, Billy ball, that's, that's the campaign. That's your campaign right there. Just go use that word. 
So I did. And we came up with this funny campaign, very early on sort of Nike-like campaign where the the athletes, the players were actually doing funny stuff and saying funny things mm. um, about the, you know, the kind of uniforms they were going to wear or things they were worried about in the middle of the game and or, you know, just crazy stuff. Uh, Billy coming out. Billy was famous for kicking dirt on umpires and abusing them, physically threatening them. And and we did a spot where, you know, commercial where he came out and was really nice to the umpire and respectful, <laughs> and, you know, said, uh, hey, you know, you, you were closer to it than I was. I mean, I, I'm just way over there, you know, that kind of thing. So we did we did funny things with Bill and it was a really big hit. Big hit. How, that, that, so that one, was, one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, during the conversation is how do you balance the dynamic between I know that this is what the campaign needs to be and the client that can sometimes get in their own way, um, uh, sabotage the work? Yeah. Um, that's you more, have to believe I'm, in that. I, I mean, that's, and and that's, that's kind of in the specificity of that story, but also. I'm sure that's part of that's life. Part of, that's life in a nutshell, man. That's, you know, that's business in a nutshell is balancing that stuff is figuring out how to convince somebody else to do something that, you know, is the right thing. You know, when you're starting a company, that's what you're doing. Um, when you're raising capital, that's what you're doing. And, you know, figuring out what your audience is and how far you can push them to understand what you're trying to do is, and, and is the right thing you believe um, is an interesting process. And a lot of times you learn trying to argue that out. You kind of adjust your own opinion of what the right thing is. And you, you learn along the way and kind of come to a compromise with the client or, you know, fun funding person and figure out like what you're going to do together, you is, know? Is and there, um, is, that's kind of what happened with this. Are there any counterintuitive lessons that you learned over the way of, okay, don't do it this way. Oh shit, this gets, that's not going to get it done. And then you learn you yeah. know, through years one, of here's, here's one. Here's one lesson. One lesson is um, if, you're, if, you're real, if your pet approach campaign um, presentation isn't working, a lot of times we have a, as humans, we have a tendency to just kind of like cut the edges off it until it finally works or we think it works when in fact we should really just go back and start over and see what happens. Like many times I've said to clients that don't like an idea, you know, I'll go back and start over and we go back and start over totally fresh. And many times you come up with something that's way better, but then a really weird thing happens in many cases, which is the clients decide to buy the first thing after all. Like mm -hmm. it kind of your willingness to, to go try something else actually convinces them that the first idea was right, which is an amazing effect. But I've seen it happen a lot. So don't be afraid to go back and start over. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a magical thing. Is, is and, and you have to have the resiliency to do it like this shit, you know, advertising or, or starting a company. It's, it's all about, you know, it's all about setbacks and how you deal with them because you're going to have them they're going to happen. Will you, you know, will you uh, go back in that process and in your mind, you know, there's a 50% chance, 70% chance they're going to buy this original idea, but it's in the process of maybe detaching from it or leaving it kind of out in the ether. And you go back and, and you just know in the back of your mind, we're going to do this other work, but they're probably going to go for this original idea. Uh, I don't I don't ever expect it, but I've seen it happen so many times, you know, I mean, it's made me more fearless about going back and starting over because, you know, many times that sells your first your first thing. And mm -hmm. and if it doesn't, maybe the first thing didn't deserve to be sold. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you have to uh, adjust, you know, Um so that certainly was a, a lesson of that Billy Ball thing is, you know, I, I did. There was an owner, Roy Eisenhardt of the A's, who was pretty skeptical about Billy Ball at the time. And he was a um, big, uh, big philanthropist and supporter of classical music and stuff. And he, he didn't get some of the popular culture jokes that we were making. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, he had to come around to those, but he did. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's a process. And then, of course, you know, predictably, three years into it, Billy 
exploded, uh, took a baseball bat and destroyed the A's clubhouse, breaking all the urinals and toilets and stuff. And they fired him. <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> so, you know, they were right, but I got three years out of it. Well, and this is something that uh, for listeners uh, to stay tuned to, because I'm going to ask you this later in the episode. I've heard you mention in other um, interviews that the average the average CMO lasts about 2.4 years or something. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and there's, uh, so I'll, we'll, we'll touch back on that, but um, you can get a lot of great work. It sounds like out of uh, a three-year commitment. It, it's, I mean, that, that manager, Billy. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, how long, how, you know, the successful companies that you had, how long did they exist? Right. Before they, you passed them along to somebody else. Right. Sometimes it's a very short period of time. And, and the, yeah. you know, manager, I've had leaders that are involved in companies for 18 months leave a really lasting positive impression, even if it just didn't ultimately work out. But the, um, okay, and so you, you do that for uh, Hal. You're, you're still there. You haven't started your own firm yet. I'm still there. So we started, um, while we're doing that, and we're really succeeding there, um, we, um, Andy Berlin, Rich Silverstein and I start working on a freelance account um, just for fun. It's brought to us by one of the account guys there, Bing Gordon, who is now um, a big venture guy at uh, at Kleiner Perkins. And yeah. he works on all kinds of stuff. And um, But at the time, he was not that yet. He was just an account guy. But uh, he, had, he had gotten together with two or three other people in San Mateo, um, n- namely Trip Hawkins, um, and, and they had put together the plans for a software company, a, a gaming company, uh, computer games. And um, we didn't really know anything about computer games, but we jumped into it, I think, with a, a record label kind of uh, take on the business, which didn't exist at the time. Computer games were really nerdy. They were sold in little um, plastic packets, floppy disks that were hung on pegs and uh, in really nerdy stores. And um, and we said, you know, what if we made like really cool like covers for these things, you know, and and um, made them have like interviews with the, the programmers so that they were like rock stars. And they were like, do you think the programmers could be rock stars? I mean, they're a bunch of nerdy, like 20 something guys. And they're like, no, they're cool. We've talked to some of them. Come on, let's do this. So we we did that and we renamed the company, which was called Amazing Software at the time. We called it Electronic Arts, which was kind of, um, it came out of United Artists, which was Charlie Chaplin's film company Mm. um, back in the 20s. And so, you know, he gathered together like a whole bunch of artists, called it United Artists because everything, everybody was together in this thing. So we went to we went to what became EA and said, you know, let's call it electronic artists. <laughs> and they said, now artists is too like, we're not artists. And we said, okay, how about electronic arts? And they were like, yeah, that's kind of cool. We like that. So we did, you know, we renamed the company, made a bunch of logos and so on. And um, they went out into the world and, you know, and obviously were a big success. They, their, their management and their production of, really big games and their their ambition was really really big and and they had really smart people and, and they let them do their thing was your ambition pretty big at that point when you were taking them on as a freelance a phenomenal freelance account to land um and did you already have those ambitions of starting your own firm and, and your own um maybe ambitions well you know you know when, yeah when on. you were talking about going to an incubator kind of thing I, I think in 1983, which is what this was, um, the idea of starting your own company was not like the first thing you would come up with. The first thing you would come up with was an opportunity or a product or an idea. And then you would go, hey, we could do this ourselves. You know, we don't have mm-hmm. to like give it to our boss here or, you mm-hmm. know, sell it to somebody. We could we could just start this. Whereas nowadays, I think it's I think that the ambition comes almost before the product or the opportunity. The, you know, you are the kind of person one is the kind of person who would start a company, 
you go, I'm going to start a company before I'm 30. I'm going to do, I'm going to do three companies before I'm 30. Mm -hmm. You know, like that ambition exists now. It didn't exist then that, that kind of thing didn't. And I've, I've been in the Silicon Valley, like throughout the growth of it. I and, mean, you know, this was early days. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I've worked for Hewlett Packard. I've worked for like all of the big startup places. And, and, you know, I know everybody down there and it's been really fun to watch that whole ambition morph and become like different things over the years. It's, it hasn't, it hasn't stayed the same. I mean, it was different in 19, mid eighties. It became different again, certainly at the end of the nineties and early two thousand. Tell me more. What, and then it's what, different again now. What, what you do know? you, how would you articulate kind of that, that arc starting in the eighties? Yeah. The 90s, yeah. Like the too. arc is a really interesting arc. I mean, I think in those days, as I say, it was more, it more started with an idea, like let's make a, a union of, of, uh, of coders, of game game makers, game designers, and um, and we'll become like the place that represents them, like a record label, and makes them famous. And we interview them and make them stars. That was a really unusual idea at the time. Nobody else mm -hmm. was doing that. And and suddenly, you know, everybody wanted to work for this new company. Um, that that was a different thing from what happened later in the like twenty years later, let's say, or fifteen years later. People in the 90s, I think the people that I knew were they were starting to have that ambition first, um, opportunity second kind of mm. thing build. And and as we know, late in the 90s, a lot of money was flooding into the Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, I, I heard somebody say that a third of the venture money in the world goes through the Silicon Valley in San Francisco, mm. a third of it. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And there was certainly at least a third of it going through there in the late 90s. And it was a time when, you know, I used to joke with people about, you know, the ideas didn't even have to be all that great. The ambition was more important than the idea. You know, mm -hmm. it was be like, you know, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make a company where you can buy like, you know, um, carbonated water online okay that's an idea <laughs> like, right well, that you know it's not a big idea that's big enough yeah you, know, you could find somebody to fund it you know it was crazy i think i think in after after the big crash around 2000 when we were you know we were we had gone through like a whole and i should back up and talk about the gaming industry a little bit in our experience there but um with other companies around 2000, we were, you know, we were seeing at companies like HP and stuff, we were seeing um, a real difference in the way that, that ideas were developed. You know, they were, the incubation of ideas was really important to everybody. And it had kind of gotten overheated. So we went through a period in the early 2000s, I think, where people were actually afraid of ideas and afraid of this, this really? process a little bit. Yeah, it had to come back. It was mm -hmm. like it was like it got smacked down bad, you know, and it had to it had to stand back up. And mm -hmm. when it stood back up, I think it stood back up in a more healthy kind of form, which was kind of a better balance between ambition and idea and ambition and funding. You know, there was a better balance between those three things. And that's what makes things really work in the end, you know, is kind of an understanding, like we were just talking about, between the the, the people with the original ideas and the, the funders and the process, you know, um, well, having, having an understanding and respect for each other. Below the line is brought to you by tinycapital.com slash below the line. If you are going to go to their website, make sure you go to tinycapital.com slash below the line so that they know where you heard this ad. But this is something that I'm really excited to tell listeners about because the service that Tiny Capital provides, Andrew Wilkinson, who's been on the podcast himself, um, is the founder. It is, a, an, it is the best way. It's the dream scenario. If you've ever thought about selling your two-person, your 200-person startup, this is the way to do it. And when I say dream scenario, it's in stark contrast to the nightmare scenario of nine months of negotiation back and forth, three months of due diligence and going back on details in the deal. And then uh, you get a year into conversation of selling your business and then the acquirer just trashes 
what you've spent years of your life building. That is the typical acquisition scenario. For Tiny Capital, they build the dream scenario where in a few days, they'll let you know whether it's a fit. They will uh, send you the deal, the actual, um, they'll send you the docs for you to sign within seven days. And they'll close within 30 days, finish up every other, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's to close within 30 days, making it extremely painless. And it's something where they do the opposite of putting you through the ringer. They want to make it super crystal clear really quickly, whether it's a fit for them. And then they also want to close the deal really quickly if it is. So if that is interesting to you and your startup, go to tinycapital.com slash below the line. That's tinycapital.com slash below the line. Today's episode is also brought to you by Magic Mind, my own little proyecto. Well, now it's kind of uh, getting beyond a project. And that was Spanish for uh, project, by the way. I can speak two languages because I'm on Magic Mind right now, and I can seamlessly switch between any language as long as it's between Spanish and English seamlessly in the midst of conversation because Magic Mind is so powerful as a cognitive enhancing beverage. It is matcha adaptogens, nootropics, and a dash of honey. It's 12 magical ingredients that get you into flow state automagically. You drink it with your morning coffee, your morning tea, and boom, within 30 minutes, you are in flow and your to-do list starts to melt away. It's built off of seven years of research, starting with me actually ending up in the ER with drinking nine cups of coffee uh, one afternoon and averaging about seven cups of coffee um, each day when I was running my last business. It was not a good site, had no idea what it was doing to my body, uh, drinking seven cups of, uh, of coffee a day and ended up uh, giving me a heart condition. That heart condition limited me to 80 milligrams of caffeine a day, which is about half a cup of coffee. And I needed to make that half a cup of coffee last the entire work day. And um, I ended up just tinkering with what nature and science gives us to get the most out of your morning ritual and found out that there is something that uh, not only I really enjoy drinking, but about 200 friends of mine were drinking uh, and subscribing to when I was making out of my kitchen before I decided, okay, about a year ago, I'm going to make this into an actual company. Uh, I can't keep doing this out of my kitchen. And here we are, Magic Mind. So go to magicmind.co and enter promo code BTL for a nice little discount for subscribers. It is magicmind.co slash BTL or magicmind.co and enter promo code BTL when you're checking out. Check it out online to see more of of just what makes this really unique and something that I'm really, I'm really passionate about bringing to the world. It's magicmind.co. Now back to the episode. I want to uh, close the gap between uh, 83 and, and 2000, but in that 2000, out of curiosity, did it with the crash and the dot com um, bust specifically, you know, or at least m- most intensely hitting tech? Did it impact y- your business? uh just as much working with those companies or was it kind of like okay that industry is a little it's could be imploding we're going to be okay because we're you know diversified the latter mostly but that's only because we were so close to the silicon valley and we we knew so many people that we were wary of it frankly Mm. and we were working for you know we're working for companies like lvmh that wanted to do um um, fashion stuff online with us. And, you know, we could see how we could see the gap between what the company wanted and what the realities were. I think at that point, and we started to get really wary of it. Like we mm-hmm. didn't take on a lot of those people so that when it crashed, we were pr- in pretty good shape. You know, we only lost four or five clients in the process and they mm-hmm. weren't our biggest clients at the time. We were, we were very lucky. Um, I've been very lucky to have the right clients at the right time. You know, I mean, when COVID started, we, we had like liquor and Comcast and, and, you know, we didn't, we didn't have an airline. We did not have, you know, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of the, we didn't have a travel company or something. Um, we didn't have a cruise line. We're very lucky. So yeah. And and for for listeners, you, you guys are behind five different Super Bowl. Uh, commercials, which is insane, uh, commercials that are about to start running, 
which it, we'll we'll touch on later in the conversation too. Yeah, okay. it's, you, yeah, you yeah. got some amazing amazing clients uh, and uh, and the depth of work even in in just the the world we're in today. It's got to be pretty uh, very lucky, very yeah, very fortunate. But yes, yeah, so you that luck started um, with it sounds like with EA, which is in, an insane yeah, yeah. brand to start with. And and so what happened next? Insane brand to start with, and and they offered to pay us in stock, which of course we we were wary of, but we ended up they were like, no, we have to pay you in stock. So we got paid in stock, and I remember at some point telling Bing Gordon, that, who was working at EA at the time, that I was really thinking of selling the stock because I wanted to buy a piano. And he said, I don't know, I think I'd hold on to it. We're doing pretty well. And I said, yeah, but it's a really nice piano. I bought a piano with my EA stock. <laughs> I still have it. It's in the other room here. And it's like a beautiful Steinway, 1926 Steinway. Oh, but, you know, I, I I saw Bing when he was developing Zynga um, a couple of years ago. And uh, and I asked him how much he thought that stock would be worth now. And he said, oh, man, it's got to be the better part of $10 million. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, wow. Shit. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's a nice it's, piano. It's, it's not. It's not it's not billions of dollars, but yeah, it's a nice piano. Yeah. Um, l- luckily, we can smile about that. Some mm-hmm. people can't smile about such things. I'm very lucky. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that through that period, we were lucky enough to, and there are probably some listeners that are old enough to remember this. We were lucky to pitch Sega at a time when the Sega Genesis was like in this massive war against uh, Nintendo. (laughs) And that was probably one of the funnest things I've ever done in advertising to tell you the truth. Really? Why? Because, well, it was, it was the gaming industry at the time The computer games that EA was developing, um, developed in the, in the nineties, but you know, the platforms had not really, had not really caught up to that. You know, computers didn't really, hadn't really um, gotten to be the powerful things that they are now. That's a whole different story, you know, with, with the companies like Compaq and Atari that we talked to at the time. But uh, so the, the computers were not really powerful enough to make games the, the wonderful things they are now. Um, instead, people were mostly playing games on these, you know, plastic pl- toy platforms that cost $200, like uh, Sega Genesis and the uh, Nintendo um, 64 kind of things. Right. And we, we pitched Sega, which is a wonderful pitch, really amazing pitch. We, uh, they told us to, uh, that we had to use some, um, some building down in the Silicon Valley at a, at a, like a holiday inn or something. We had to use their ballroom to do the pitch. So we, we actually like tented the ballroom off with black and, we had a kid like up in the front, we had piled up all these TV sets. And, uh, you know, this was before the days of being able to do a big digital screen. Um, and we hooked them together digitally so that they made like an enormous screen. And he was playing like, you know, um, Sonic or something, one of the Sega games on the screen when the pitch started. Wow. Then we had we had bleachers all around the, the room. And we had brought the whole company or entire company down there with us. So which was probably 225 people at the time Whoa. and had them in bleachers around the room. And, and I got to tell these guys that, that there was a, a person in the, in the crowd here that had, there was a specialist in every Sega game. And if you ask about a certain Sega game, somebody could stand up and talk about that game and the upper levels of it. They had played it for the last few weeks. So that was really impressive to them. We also yeah. suggested a whole bunch of... Out of, out of curiosity, <laughs> what, t- tell me more about like that. the elaborateness of that is sounds um, incredible. Is that is that par for the course? I don't know too much about the, the ad world advertising it, pitching yes yeah, is, that, is that elaborate yeah. was that i mean like are some people coming in with a, you know slide deck and you come in with that you know right after yeah well we knew we were up against a really good agency from portland called widening kennedy that now does like all the nike advertising mm-hmm. so 
we knew we were up against them and they had rented a theater in San Francisco called the George Coates Theater that's like a big um, performance arts place. So we knew they were doing something crazy too. And mm. and so that's why we kind of went all out. We, we brought the whole company. I got a sound system because, you know, there was no sound system available at this holiday. And I, I got a sound system that the Grateful Dead used for small venues i mean wow. the thing was fucking amazing yeah <laughs> and uh so you know it, it, the games the game sounds were like you know godlike in this space so it was awesome um it, it was really it was an overpowering presentation we made all these like leather jackets with with sonic on them and stuff that we were wearing when we did the presentation did, and have it you, was awesome have you made elaborate pitches like that? when you when you're making a pitch like that um one, it sounds like the creative energy going into the pitch uh, is yeah. just as creative as the actual pitch. W when you're making that type of elaborate pitch, if you go back to where you were, you know, psychologically, in that room, were you kind of like, "Man, I hope we get this"? Uh, we had, are you thinking we're gonna get this, or had you done it long enough to where you're like, "Man, I'm," you know, I just have to be comfortable with doing these elaborate pitches, putting everything into it, and we might not win the deal. I think that you, over time, you develop a certain, you know, style that is your own style for doing this stuff. You have to, everybody's different. You know, I've watched all kinds of presenters. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've watched Steve Jobs do his presentation in 1999 when he came back to Apple to run it. You know, he did a business presentation to me and two or three other people of what he was thinking. And I thought... You know, this guy is off the hook. He's like ridiculously good at this shit. <laughs> Why? How? Like, and, what are the things from an expert to an expert? What did you notice? If you could almost go super deep and specific into what you noticed to where you know, like, you know okay. what super, you know what, you know what people had in common that do that stuff that are really good, like he was. They tell the truth. That's that's what mm -hmm. they do. They find a way to convince you that they're telling you the truth. And he started out, his presentation was, and this is, it was probably the best business presentation I've ever seen. I mean, I think he had one slide that was like, business is in the toilet mm -hmm. <laughs> slide. And he said, yeah, this is what's happening to us. As you can see, it's not good. I don't have any new product that's any good. You know, I don't, I, I'm going to get it. I've got ideas, but the current product is not good. So that's that that ain't going to get us out of this problem. He said, um, um, here's my idea. We're not going to sell computers anymore to businesses like we're now trying to compete with IBM and sell, you know, boxes on desks to people. We're totally failing at that. We're wasting our time. We don't make the right boxes. Our salespeople can't make the right sales. You know, we, we are we look like a dinky kind of newfangled company compared to IBM. We're getting killed. We're not going to do that anymore. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make computers for people like you, creative people and people mm -hmm. that think they're creative people. So it's going to be like advertising people, artists, architects, college students, people on their way up that have hopes about what they can do in life. Those are the people that I'm going to make computers for from now on. We're not going to make them for those gray people with the ties sitting at their desk and the poor people that are putting together like logs of this. And, and we're not going to make those anymore. We're not going to talk to them. So it's going to be all, and he really did. I think at that presentation without ever, ever having any marketing people tell him. So I think he said, you know, it's going to be for people that just think different in the world. Mm. I think he said those words. And, I, and, you know, we all came away like, holy shit, you know, I hope he comes up with a decent machine at some point because it's a really great vision. Did <laughs> And, of course, he did. What what would have been the counter if, if Steve Jobs is the apex presenter that nails one of those meetings? Mm -hmm. What would be, you know, someone smart, not a complete fool, but uh, someone that's smart but gets it completely wrong in that type of scenario that, that you've seen in your career? I think the wrong ones also have similarities, you know, that I've seen, and they are usually um, 
they're usually a person like living inside their own head with an idea for something that ought to happen, but the context around them does not line up at all with, with what they're thinking. Like, look at what Jobs did. Jobs took into account, like, what's going on in the world, you know? I can't do this. I can do this. This is an opening that I can run through. And I think that a lot of times people, founders, the people that are that are trying to trying to sell ideas are are too much in their own heads. They're not looking at the context around them, you know, um, at, at what can happen. I, here's here's an example. We worked very early on for a company called Gavilan Computer, and and it was really the first laptop computer. And this is how old I am. Like, you know, this was the first like attempt to make a laptop computer. And it was run by a guy named Manny Fernandez, who was a big Wunderkind kind of guy in the Silicon Valley. It started a couple of other companies. And in this computer, I mean, it was it was a little bit of a head fake because you know, it, had, it, it, it was hardware, but the software, you know, there wasn't enough memory in those days to be able to handle, like, you know, the, 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 the hardware of the computer and also store the software all in one thing. So it had these little cartridges that you would put in if you wanted to, like, do word, pro you had to carry, like, eight or ten cartridges with you. If you mm -hmm. wanted to do word processing, you'd plug in that cartridge and then you could do that. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to do, like, a spreadsheet, you'd plug in the spreadsheet cartridge and do that. Yeah. But so it, was a, it wasn't really a laptop computer. It was a, it was a box with a, well, a bag of uh, cartridges <laughs> is what it was. And uh, But the guy, the guy was, like, really good at selling you on this idea. But it didn't take into account like the world. The world didn't didn't want that. The world didn't want a, a laptop computer and a bag of cartridges at the time. And it, it was a, it was a wonderful presentation. And when you were in the room with Manny, the thing would really make sense. But when it got out into the world, it just made no sense. I went to CES and you know computer electronics show in Las Vegas that year, and I just remember people going like. So there's this, but then I have to have all that with me too. It's kind of bullshit, isn't it? You know, <laughs> and, uh, right. and, uh, and 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 I understood. You know, I mean, it was a, it was being blind to the context. You can't be blind to your context. If you know? if he were giving that presentation instead of Jobs, what would it, what 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 points would he have made? What like what would he have done differently? You mean if he were given Steve's presentation? Yeah. If you were to take over Steve's and you're uh, uh, take over Apple, he's in Steve's shoes. You're chatting with him, and instead of you know the slide going down to the right, like what do you think? Uh, I think he's a guy. I think he's a guy that would have said, um, "We're we're competing with IBM and we're not succeeding. We need to change our machines to 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 compete better." Okay, mm -hmm. and here's what's wrong with our machines, and we're going to make them compete better with with IBM. I don't think he was the kind of because he would have that's the way he thought he thought let's take let's take these big computers and make them into a little laptop that's a great idea you know it was a great mm -hmm. idea to make a laptop the thing was the technology didn't exist to do that yet so he came up with something that wasn't quite that mm -hmm. tried to force it on the world the world didn't like it well that's kind of what you know if you had taken the time to kind of um, to, to kind of change Apple into something that competed better with IBM, which is kind of what was happening before Steve got there. They were trying to make machines that competed better as as desktops. Um, that that wouldn't have won. It wasn't a vision. The vision was to stop that, to stop doing that, and mm -hmm. do something else, and find a different context. And and that's what Jobs did so well. He he found a different context, you know, and that's. That's kind of that's a really important skill. Really important skill. Right. He usually yeah. gets lauded for the um, style, um, but the substance. It sounds like that was what impressed you most. Is like, man, this guy knows what not to do, what they can do, and this is an interesting uh, demographic to go after that is largely uh, underserved, perhaps. And, and as I said, it had the ring of truth. You know, I mean, he he. Of course, he was a performer. So, he, you know, he was a guy that could make you think he was worried <laughs> and he was taking a lot of chances here and he didn't know if this was right. But, you know, the place is fucked. 
I'm, you know, I'm going to burn it down and start over, you know. Um, he was good at that, and it was very convincing, but it had truth in there. There was truth to it, you know, and that's, I think, I think that's what makes for great business presentations and great business ideas. It has to have, like, a piece of truth in it that, you know, that proves itself out in the context. Uh, it's, it, can't, it can't be the gavel and computer with a bag of cartridges. You know? Right, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, laughing. Just imagine you. You say you he was convincing and make you think that he was worried. Like, tell me more about that. Just to get specifically into a, a, a stylistic kind of um, uh, angle. What do you mean? Did he like physically try to you know scratch his head and, and make you feel like he's worried and say, yeah. say things uh -huh. like that? Yeah, I can remember. I can remember the day very specifically because he hadn't gone into the black shirt. Like, look, the thing that I'm wearing today. He hadn't <laughs> gone into this black shirt um, phase yet. You know, mm -hmm. he had a yellow sweater on. I swear to God, like a V-neck yellow <laughs> sweater with a bow tie. I swear, with a uh -huh. bow tie on. So really, that was Steve. Like, bef that was Steve before he became like David Bowie, Steve. You know? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, that, you know, he, him, him in that outfit, which was like very responsible looking outfit, looking worried about this and what am I going to do? And, you know, it was really convincing, you know, it was, it was good. And it, and it came out of the truth. He was a guy that was really worried. And, and it was, he was back at the company that he had founded, been kicked out of, came back. And he, he did have to do something different. The company was, was foundering. So he was saving his baby in a way you know um so i think he did a wonderful thing which was to take take off the head of the present kind of go back to the original um the way he thought when he started the company you know which was which was cool yeah it was cool to watch him do that and it's um, and it's cool to hear that kind of behind closed doors pitch side uh versus the um we are invincible. Uh, this is the greatest thing ever on the stage side of a pitch uh, where it's. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. He, he turned into a guy that didn't, um, didn't ever show weakness after that for publicly, you know, mm -hmm. um, he probably never showed weakness even in those days publicly, but I, I got to see him worry, yeah. which was interesting. I got to see Steve jobs worry. <laughs> that is, um, sounds like it was uh it it yeah. that worry and that concern paid off um okay and so this yeah. is you're you're in it's in the 90s um and you've started you you started your own firm you uh, right after with ea kind of being that first client you're like all right we're ready for yeah yeah be Silverstein. and this is good uh, this is good be and silverstein this is you two, yeah, and, and it, Andy Berlin, so and Ber three that's creative right. guys. Good be Berlin Silverstein at the time. Um, well, out of curiosity, and, how do you decide whose name goes first in a company naming situation like that? Well, everybody has a different story for that. I, I, re you know, Berlin says that that I Goodby would not have start would not have joined him to do this thing if he if he didn't put my name first. <laughs> that could be true. Um, uh, Silverstein says they just looked better that way when he designed it, <laughs> um, putting himself last. And, uh, and, and I remember going to the phone operator at Hal Reine's place and saying, if you had to answer the phone all the time saying these three names, what order would you put them in? And she went, it would either be Goodby, Berlin, and Silverstein, or Berlin, Goodby, and Silverstein. Now I like Goodby, Berlin, and Silverstein. I said, okay, so that that's I use that. Yeah, <laughs> that, put it put I it off know. on someone else. Um, I that, put it off on somebody else. Yeah. Okay, and so you've started Goodby, Berlin, Silverstein, and um, and this we'll go into the the '90s. At, you have the infancy of the freelance opportunity that becomes EA. Um, how does that, how do you go from being a part of someone else's team, having some wins and now managing, uh, how did you just, it, it's such a, um, it's such a progression evolution required in a leader to do the work and then leading other creative, specifically creative individuals would love to hear your own narrative arc from 
doing the work to, all right, now we've got 200 people, we're winning Sega, and holy shit, I'm kind of at the helm of yeah. Of this well, thing. the you know, the, there are two things that happen, and you'll recognize them. The first one is, you know, we're three creative guys, so you need to have a business person like to actually figure out how to run the business while you're doing this stuff. And we thought that was really important. It's somewhat less important looking back on it. Like we were pretty good at doing that kind of thing ourselves, but we we thought we had to have a, a business head. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time like hiring and firing presidents. <laughs> That's kind of what we did, you know, for the first three or four years of the business. We probably, I think we had like three right away before, you know, hire, fire, Kind of situations before we finally settled on a person that stayed for quite a while so that happens you know you got to find a person who you know at first we thought we need somebody who has run an agency before well that person came in and actually you know made all the same mistakes that a big agency would make so with that didn't work mm -hmm. then we we went okay what we really want is just a person to watch the money you know, we don't want them to be in the business. We don't want them to mess with clients or be in the creative part of the business. We tried that, and that was a person who, you know, made all his decisions on the basis of money, and we didn't want to do that, so that didn't work. So, you know, you, you eventually find somebody that's sensitive to the parts of the business that you really care about, but also um, takes care of the part of the business that, you know, you can't do, that you're not mm. qualified to do. And we finally hit upon a, an English guy who could do that, which was really good. It was kind of like, you know, getting, it was like the Beatles finding Brian Epstein or something, you know, or, you know, finding, you know, somebody that could do the business for them and, and not get in their way. That would, that would be respectful to their side of the business. So that was a big thing, you know, and, and the other part of the thing is to just have your eyes open for connections, you know, one of the things in business in general is that people that they're so driven with a with a vision for what the business should be um, that that they don't notice things that are right under their noses that are opportunities. Oh, and I can completely you know, people, sympathize with that of just being so locked in right? to five years out. This is what this is where we can go, and and you just can't listen to what the world's telling you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly you, you stop listening to what the world is telling you and and it is a process of of having that having that vision but also listening to what the world is telling you to do next and um and sometimes the world gives you like you know a big turkey dinner and you don't even notice it <laughs> you got to really be you got to be looking for it when it when it arrives what would be an example and, um, that comes to mind that's a, a turkey dinner that had you not been aware or listening you could have easily missed it. Well, you've got to do some stupid things where you put yourself out in, in maybe situations that you wouldn't have otherwise done. For instance, I remember us thinking that we were like so cool, too school, too cool for school to 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 do something like this. But the local advertising business um, sort of organization had a uh, had a thing where they would give like uh, 10 minutes to a new company to present themselves to this business community in San Francisco. So it's kind of like, you know, a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of business people, the old gray part of San Francisco, some of the new cool people, um, but kind of a weird admixture that we were too cool to be to pay any attention to. But when they had this day where you could go to talk for 10 minutes, I went, I oh, screwed. I'm just going to go over and do it. You guys, you know, and my partners were like, okay. So I went over and I said, you know, my name is Jeff and I started this and we do this. And, you know, I gave like a little 10 minute, very nervous kind of talk to this, to this group. And after it was over, um, William Randolph Hearst the third, who was the publisher of the San Francisco examiner at the time came up and said, I want to come over and like talk to you guys. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I think you'd be right for me because I'm, I'm, I'm working at this. It was a similar kind of Steve Jobs thing. I'm working at this newspaper that is really in the toilet, and I'm going to fix it by bringing in 
like great columnists, a great editor. I've got a list of people that I'm about to hire and I want to talk to you about that. So he came over and talked to us and, and you know, it wasn't like an enormous amount of money, but we, um, we came up with a campaign that ran locally where, you know, it was really, he was in, he was in the advertising Will yeah. himself, who was like a very cool kind of 40 year old, um, you know, um, inheritor of this really big media business. And um, he was a magnetic character. So we shot him going around hiring, making believe he was hiring these people like Hunter S. Thompson, who was in a commercial and, you know, um, famous columnists and editors. He w- we would do funny commercials where he would be trying to talk these people into working there. And, uh, and it turned into a really big hit. And, you know, it kept the examiner alive for years. And, you know, of course, he's still he's still just fine publishing a big magazine and stuff now, but it was a matter of doing something that, you know, you weren't comfortable doing, like just taking the chance of going over there and hanging out and, you know, probably failing. But um, it was a new audience of people to take a chance on talking to. What would the, what do you think um, Hearst saw in your presentation that maybe you were just kind of, you know, caught up. I'm giving the presentation, but now on the other side of uh, you know, building out this agency, what do you think he saw that made him think, okay, that's the, those are the people I want to go talk to if he had, I imagine, with his uh, you know, inherited wealth, he could, have, he could have gone to anyone to help fix the brand of the examiner. Well, obviously, you got to make sense in these presentations a little bit. And I don't know what I said in terms of what our philosophy was or whatever. I'm sure that I, you know, I'm sure I, I'm sure I did not sound like a big agency person when I spoke. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's that's key. What but does a big agency person lessons, sound like? Oh, you know, we have systems that do this and we have a department that does this and, you know, and we guarantee results and so on. I think I sounded much more like an art guy that, you know, we don't guarantee results, but we think these ridiculously expansive things that, you know, change the world. It's kind of the way we still talk. And um, I, I think that he he enjoyed that. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is, Many times what you say or the work that you show is not as important as the, the chemistry that you show with the people around you when you're like making your presentation, you know, mm-hmm. like um, I think I think when Will came over and saw the three of us together, I always liken it to a rock band you want to hang out with, you know, like mm-hmm. there's you, you know how you go in a room sometimes and you can tell that there's some friction between the yeah. three partners. You know, that this guy is not talking to her. And it's very clear that, you know, he he doesn't say anything and she does all the talking or whatever it is. Like right. there's some friction you can feel. And that friction kills presentations and it kills companies. You know, I mean, the thing that works and I tell people this all the time before presentations is, you know what? Fuck it. Have a good time. Smile and enjoy each other. Like we have to enjoy each other and give each other some shit while we're on the, while we're at the table with these people, because that's what makes us magnetic. That's that they won't even hear our presentation. If they like us, they'll, they'll just want to hang with us. That's, that's what's going to win. this. It's so funny. You mentioned that because one of the, one of the guests that's been on the podcast before uh, a guy, Corby Davidson, who's uh, one of the most uh, listened to radio hosts in, um, in Dallas, Fort Worth, I think it is like the number two most listened to radio station in the country. Uh, it's called the ticket. And, um, I grew up listening to him. So I had him on, on the podcast and, uh, and it was just like a dream come true for me. But one of the things that he said was, um, one of the most important parts of his job is each day that he has to tell himself, you know, each day is to make it sound like they're having more fun in the studio than you are in your car on the drive you know, to work or in the community. He's right. And, and that's so, and and it's, that's an insight that that station really does nail that it is. It sounds like you are listening to three friends bullshitting and and having a blast and you aspire to that. Um, but I, 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 do you, is that something that's so funny? You mentioned that, you know, that, that dynamic between the, the group is, is, 
I don't know, such a significant part well, of the pitch. Um, do you tell that to everyone at the company? Is that is that something that's codified of, you know, people need to walk away feeling like, man, those five creatives at Goodby Silverstein, they really are friends. They get along. I, I tell them that. I, I literally, so we have a bunch of um, corporate company traditions around new business things. And, you know, we do a lot of rehearsing. Like we think out what we're going to say, which I think is important. A lot of times, a lot of times you get the presentation together and you've got all the right materials and everything, but you spend all of your time getting the right materials together and putting the slides together. And you never really sit down together and go, you know, what, what's this thing going to look like? <laughs> what, mm-hmm. what will we sound like when we say it? <laughs> And you don't, and I've, I've done this myself, you know, you just don't leave the time to do that properly. And mm-hmm. that's the most important time because you find out there are holes and things and stupid, you know, and then, and, and if you get in the room and start discovering the holes there, then you get irritated with each other and the whole rock star thing goes down the tubes. So <laughs> the drummers playing the sax, the sax players accidentally playing the bass. And you're like, what is going on? Exactly. Yeah. You get irritated and you show it, you know? I mean, I, I remember being in a presentation where Andy Berlin d- just said to the client, this is going so badly. We have to stop <laughs> and like talk to each other for a minute. Can we just take a break? <laughs> and of course that totally blew the whole thing. We lost it the moment he said that you can't do that. You can't, you can't show that face. Does um, <laughs> what are some of the other things you've codified around new business that uh, that someone we you know, we drink a in? certain wine the night before we drink a certain really? wine the night before we always drink the same wine. What is that? What's and the wine? We we have been it's it's a uh, it's a Sterling uh, a Jordan Cabernet. It's a Jordan Cabernet. Doesn't have to be any particular year. Just their Cabernet Sauvignon, and we make everybody drink it like the night before. It's like the Last Supper everybody has to drink some of it and um because we hang out and like rehearse the thing some of mm-hmm. us drink a lot of it some don't but mm-hmm. everybody like has a little bit of it and uh and, and we've been like out in the woods in maine and stuff and and we've had to, we've had to have the stuff shipped there because it's like who's got the who's got the cavern <laughs> you know? yeah <laughs> well where is it you know it's like that uh, How did you discover that a, in the power of a ritual like that? I think, you know, it just became like a superstition or something at some point. Like we must have won a, a pitch and and had that and thought that that was the reason. Yeah. And then from then on, it was sort of the, you know, it was like the superpower juice after that. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, okay. So Jordan it's, Cabernet. It's not up. bad. Yeah, go ahead. Traditions are good up to a point. Like they can they can lock you into doing the same thing over and over. But this tradition was built upon getting the group to be happy together. You know mm-hmm. that, and that's to feel comfortable. And that's what you need. That's the secret. The secret, the secret, the, the, the superpower is to show that you love each other and have a sense of humor, and you can be talked to. And and actually, when I judge clients or you know, when you judge a um, somebody that's going to give you some financing, I think it's always good to look for the relationships between those people. You know, can they give each other some shit? I mean, I love it when <clears throat> when we meet a client where the the people at the lower levels of the company can actually give the boss a little bit of like good humored shit in front of you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, such a good sign for a good client. It's a mm-hmm. really good sign. If they can tell a little joke and go, you know, this guy always does this. This is what, you know, and everybody laughs. That's a really good sign, you know? Yeah, you're looking for um, that, that those dynamics too, I imagine, when you're pitching. Yeah, you must, you must. You know, and when you're, when in any kind of business relationship, it's a good thing to look for. Right. Um, it's a positive thing. And you you know you'll be able to talk to those people if things go bad. You know, because your company might not perform up to what they expect or, you know, your advertising might not be as good as what they expect. And you have to be able to talk to them. And that shows that people can talk to them. I think it's important. Okay. So you have the the wine, you have the rehearsing like crazy. What are some of the other things around new business that you all do? 
any anything to make people comfortable you know we also we also are very honest about i mean you know once again we're really big on telling people the truth i mean a lot of people think that advertising is about like making shit up to you know to cover things up or you know making some story up that you sell people and that's not what good advertising does i mean good advertising puts the product in a context that is true you know mm -hmm. like nobody cares about milk unless you run out of it you know got milk that's that's a context you know mm -hmm. that's people don't care about milk they don't think of milk as like magically uh bodybuilding shit you know right. it's just something you put on cereal or in your coffee um so you know you were told the truth about it and i think that that is a big part of what we look for at presentations like tell the truth and one of the ways that we get truthful with people is we always try to come up with 10 reasons why they should hire us and we tell them that at the very end of the presentation. So every time we do a presentation, we tell them, yeah, you can ask, ask us questions about the presentation, but we're going to come back and do a little one or two minute thing at the very end that, you know, you should stick around for. So we take questions and, you know, talk about what we just showed. But at the very end, we go, okay, here are 10 ironclad reasons you should hire us. And we really think about what those reasons are. And I read them out loud to them and, um, you know, and we really try hard to do two things at once. One is to think up what the other agencies we're competing with are liable to say and come up with something that kind of makes that seem silly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and two, um, come up with things that make it clear that we understand their problem, you know, that we'll be, we'll look at it with, because a lot of this stuff is about taking your own head off and putting on the head of the person you're talking to and thinking that way or seeing, seeing yourself from the other side of the table, you know, like what Steve jobs did, just being vulnerable a mm -hmm. little bit, you know? Yeah. And, it's, um, it, it sounds it's important. like all of these things, taking your head off, putting theirs on, uh, seeing what they see, telling the truth, being vulnerable. It sounds like all, so much of what you do is around awareness, um, it, like exceptional self-awareness and situational awareness. Uh, it's. I think that's true of of any good business. You know, I mean, if you're lucky enough to discover that, you know, everybody needs uh, everybody needs one of these silver tabs on top of this can, and you know, you can be a total dick, and they'll still buy it then you're very lucky, but that's mm -hmm. most businesses don't work that way. <laughs> right. Right. Um, the, yeah. uh, you mentioned something early on that I wanted to, uh, and this kind of brings it back up with new business and, and new people joining, um, the firm and, and uh, the agency and kind of learning the ways you mentioned that junior people won't, uh, you, you, you worry about junior people joining good be silver scene today. And Getting overwhelmed. Getting overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. Walk me through um, yeah, a little bit more of, of why you said that and walk me through what advice you would give to someone that is, you know, on day one and they're they're you, you know, twenty four years old. They somehow landed a great job at, at your agency. What advice would you give them to navigate how tough it could be? Well, I spend a certain amount of time trying to talk to those people when they first get there, if I possibly can. Like during this COVID thing, I've been scheduling talks with people like in the one-on-one -on -one talks and, you know, they, they, they're probably scared shitless and I'm calling them up, <laughs> but I'm calling them up for no reason, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just get them on the phone and go, how are you doing? What's going on? You know, what are you working on? And it's actually fun. And, and I think they enjoy it, but uh, I, I try to keep in contact with them. And some people are not good at um, trying to maintain that contact from their end. Like I tell people all the time, come show me what you're working on. You know, I'm like, show me some of your work. I mean, even clients that I'm not working on, I just want to just want to see what you're doing. Like if you're excited about something, bring it in because mm -hmm. I like I like to be excited and uh and only half of the people will actually do it, you know, like half of them will respond to that and bring something in, but the other half don't. And I think, you you know, if somebody gives you that opportunity, take it, 
You know, if somebody says come in and, or even if they don't give you that opportunity, I think it's good to take something that you're excited about. I don't think very few bosses are going to go get out of my office. I don't want to talk to you. Right. If you come right. in and go, I'm really excited about this thing. Check it out. You know, I mean, I have a new way of solving this that nobody's thought of so far. What do you think of this? I mean, that's a that's a really good thing to do. Um, and so I try to encourage people to do that. What is an example of someone that's really good at that? If you think in your mind, no, you know, not specifically, you don't have to name them, but in your mind, that's really good at showing you what they're excited about. Walk me through like what they're, what they're good at and, and why uh, you think they're, you know, kind of nailing that re- rapport aspect, relationship building, and, and maybe someone that just goes silent after getting to meet the big boss and then goes silent for a year. Well, the ones that the ones that go silent, you know, are I, 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 I don't get to talk to them because they're silent. I have to really work hard to go see them, you know. Um, but there are two kinds of the people that come to to talk to me. One is just somebody that likes to talk, and they don't necessarily have a great thing to show me, <laughs> but they have the nerve to come in and talk to me and go like. You work with so and so, it's really hard to work with her. What do you do when she acts this way? You know, mm-hmm. so that's good. I don't mind that. And then there are other people that really have to work their nerve up to come in, but they talk about something that's totally off the wall, which is great. You know, mm-hmm. like, like you know, I've been working on this AI project that you know can bring this person. I think we can machine learn some way to bring this person to life, and it could become an exhibit at the Dolly Museum. You know, I I have I have people that kind of shyly come in and tell me some crazy thing like that. Or this is this is a perfect one. Some we were working for a uh, prescription drug company, and uh, this guy said, uh, um, "I'm working." He's he was a very shy, creative guy, but he took me up and came in and he said, "I'm working on this prescription drug thing, and prescription drugs are very expensive in the United States." but they're not expensive in Canada. They're not expensive in a lot of other countries. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how can we make it so that Americans can buy drugs at, at those kind of prices without, mm-hmm. the, without the markups and taxes and things that happen in the US? He said, well, there is a place, we're in the San Francisco office. He said, there is a place um, two miles from here where that could happen. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, yes. It's out. To, it's off the coast in international waters. So I want to put a drugstore, like a big drugstore, in international waters that people can like take their boats out to. <laughs> and I said, wow. and you had a design for it. Like it had all these slips where you could pull in with your boats and buy drugs. And I said, this is awesome. He said, yeah. So people, what would happen is people would buy drugs. I know this is what would happen is people would buy drugs in bulk and bring them in and resell them with slight markups, but they'd still be way below the price of of drugs in the U.S. (laughs) So, you know, that kind of idea is is awesomely cool. (laughs) And uh, to have somebody come in and kind of shyly show you. So the most important thing yeah. to get across is bosses welcome that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to do it. Right. I always it's a, yeah, it's a compliment to them to have you come in. Yeah. Right. right. It's a compliment to to the boss to have you come in and take the time to show it. Show yeah. It, show your it, stuff. When when I would fundraise for for businesses and and I've done it uh, various times in the last decade and it's usually kind of a a um, intense two weeks, three weeks of just going and meeting a lot of investors. I thought it was just such a cool, it was a win no matter what, whether they, whether it it developed into any uh, working relationship or not, it was just such a unique um, moment in time to get to go meet, you know, brilliant people, chat with brilliant people, get it, get advice on, on, you know, it's almost like free consulting. If you get to meet with Mark Andreessen on what you need to change about your idea, it's, it's, I mean, it's a win, win, uh, no matter what, um, totally. you either get the deal or you get great advice or, and ideally you get a great, um, you know, point of relationship after that, um, or reference point for the relationship after that. That's, um, with with managing within kind of um, that universe of managing creatives, what is um, someone on 
the outside that doesn't know anything about ad, ad agencies, um, I feel like it's kind of, you know, Mad Men style, um, you know, you're pitching and you're hoping to win the deal. Um, and what, how do you manage your own creative energy through this, um, putting all of these, all this energy into a pitch, you don't get the deal or you can't get your idea across. It sounds like, at, at, you know, just zooming out what, why I asked this question, it sounds like almost really freaking painful for a creative mind to then have to <laughs> channel it through maybe uh you know a third party that doesn't uh see what you see how do you navigate that and we talked about that a little bit about how you nail you know the the idea you want to get through like billy ball but um how do you manage sure. your, your own psychology in yeah. that in this process your own attachment to your ideas well i mean i tell people that it's a business of rejection you just have to be ready for it you know, the people that do well are people that can get up and go back and do it again, like I said, and not be deterred by it. So, you know, you're coming up with an idea, you know, you reject a lot of ideas with yourself and then you go to work and you show them to your partner and she rejects them and then you get it through her and then you go show it to your creative director and she rejects them and then you go take it to the client and the client rejects it and then you get to make the thing and you you know you're watching it at home and your kids think it sucks and you know like it's just rejection all the way down the line really? it's like it's like a minefield man <laughs> and uh so you got to be kind of ready for it and be able to bounce back from it you know that's a big part of it oh, man. um i had i would so not I tell, have I tell that. people that, you know the people that the people that can do it are, you know, they're they're they have a lot of perseverance and, they, and belief in themselves. And one of the things I was going to say about juniors, by the way, is that everybody's got a different style. You know, like I've seen really successful people that are very outgoing, you know, um, you know, and, and very uh, very directed. They you know ex they give you the impression that they really really know what they want, or you know, a Mark Andreessen kind of guy gives you the impression he's just incredibly smart and fun to listen to, you know? Um, and, you know, you're pretty much listening to him, you know, when you, when you deal with him mm. and, um, but that's, that's a style. And I think that everybody has a, has a successful style. They just, they don't, you know, if you're lucky enough, you figure out what that is. Mm. And some people are very, very shy and kind of um, not really performing um, kind of people. Well, that can work in your favor. You just have to discover that and have that be you, you know, mm -hmm. and don't try to be her, or be you. And, and I, I tell people that you have an innate sense of humor, you know, you're from Brazil. Don't try to be an American, be a funny Brazilian, you know, bring your sense of humor to America. Don't try to be an American. Um, and, and, and a lot of it comes out of you and accepting of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing about creative work is, you know, when you're when you're just a line art director or writer or something, you think, oh, man, I could be a creative director. It's, you know, I, I that would be so easy. I'd love to judge other people's shit. And mm -hmm. actually, when you do it the first time, first of all, you make the mistake of like loving everything everybody shows you so that they'll like you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you go, yeah, you know, that's great. That thing's great. And then they all like you and go, yeah, Jeff's really cool. And then you go home that night and you go. I don't think that thing was really that good, but I got to figure out how to tell them that it's not that good. So then you figure out ways to tell people that the thing sucks. You just what are some ways that what are some you ways have to be able to do learned that. over time? Um, like well, specifically, it, yeah, what, that you really do use. You use you you have to you have to you have to gauge what the person is like. There are some people that you can just go, you know, the thing sucks go start over, you know, you know, you can't, you can't use, you can't use a, you can't use a duck to sell that, you know, come mm -hmm. on, this isn't a job for a duck, you know, but then there are other people that you have to kind of go, well, let's think about this. Cause if it's a duck, it's kind of going to be weird because ducks lay eggs and we're talking about eggs and it's going to be confusing. You know, you have to mm -hmm. get more rational with them. Um, but it's somewhere between those two things, you know, you have, again, you're putting on the head of the person on the other side. There are some people that can just take it and you go, this thing sucks. 
go home, do it again. You know, um, is, is there any difference in the quality of the work of, of that person? Or do you have great creative minds that need that sensitive approach and great creative minds that uh, can yeah, handle that? There are great people that can do that are both kinds. Mm. There are great people that are both kinds. Yeah. There are great people that are incredibly sensitive and you have to be really careful <laughs> that you handle them. Where, you know, where do you always, fall? Where do you fall on the spectrum? I, I'm pretty sensitive. Like I, I notice when people are, you know, not digging something. I, I really notice it pretty quickly, you know, and, mm-hmm. and zoom cause, because it, you know, a lot of, a lot of creative people are pretty insecure deep down, even though they're performance people, you know? And so, yeah, they're pretty sensitive to stuff. You have it's to probably, be careful. It's one of, one of the things yeah, I was going to say is that I think, I think great bosses in creative businesses serve the people that work for them. They, they they give the impression that they're serving you. They're bringing out the best in you. You know, like like I can go to her and she will make this better. She will bring it out of me. Like I'll get better in front of her. If you can give people that impression, that's really good. That's you know? and that that's something that I had to learn the hard way over trying to, well, maybe early stage founders that are listening to the podcast or in creators in general, you get to a certain point because you are coming up with the ideas and you are pushing it forward. And uh, it's a weird thing when you traverse to a different role where it's like, no, that's the worst thing you can, do. maybe it works in the short run, but the worst thing you can do is, is be the creator instead of giving that just big raw lump to someone else that's going to polish it into something um, beautiful. But if you, you know, I I learned that the hard way with feedback from people that if you rob them of that, then what the hell are they there for? Um, because it is so gratifying to do that, even if it's, you know, take some learning, uh, you know, bumping into walls along the way. Yeah, it's a real art to to be able to take to be able to take this beautiful mountain that you've created, give it to somebody else and ha- and say, how can you improve this? And they go, well, you know, I would put a big train tunnel through it. And you're like, you have to find a way to go, well, I don't think it should have a train tunnel. <laughs> you have to find a nice way to say that. Or to go, I'd never thought of that. That's wonderful. But you have to be able to invite both of those and have you have to be find a way to say both of those things with, if they're appropriate, you know, like people, people are going to come to you with really crazy ways to blow up your idea. And you have to be able to make them come back with more ideas, even though you rejected that one, you know, do you, that's, it's do you, an art. Do you have, it is, uh, it's a, it is such an art. Do you have um, experience with l- completely letting go? And that mountain does become something that you just never thought of and it and it's great. Oh. Or have you learned over time, you know what, actually I do need to stick with this a little bit and say no, it needs to be a mountain that has these, you know, features. Well, I think that eventually you start to go, what are the kind of things about this mountain that I like? You know, I want it to be respectful of humanity. I want it to have a sense of humor. I want it to so your 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 demands get more abstract so that people can build other things inside your 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 little your little firmament that aren't just mountains you know suddenly somebody will put a skyscraper up and you'll be like that's great you know it's it, it, it's still inside what i understand mm-hmm. here and you have to be expansive and expand those those um those fields of vision for yourself and for other people, you know, um, instead of narrowing them, like a lot of people, you know, you're right. A lot of bosses are like, not only did I invent this thing, but I'm refining it in my head and you have to do it this way. I don't think that successful, even, even Elon Musk kind of people, I don't think succeed if they act that way. I think they, they go, okay, I got this idea. We're going to go to Mars, but you know, figure it out. (laughs) I think, I think that at some point they go, help me figure this out because it's crazy. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And, uh, yeah, it's, and it is so different. It's good. The- it's good to say, help me figure it out. I mean, Steve right. jobs was basically like, help me figure this out. That's right. a really good way to be a boss. Help me figure this out. And that is so counter you to know? what the narrative, you know, would 
make you believe where it's it is this singular figure comes up with this grand plan and architects the whole thing and well that has to be the case because they're on the cover of the magazine and the interviews with them but it's really never it's never that it with elon musk i know that he specifically was such a hard ass uh ceo with paypal that they replaced him pretty quickly and it was such a pain in the ass to work with him at paypal i'm sure it he learned quite, he learned. A, bit, quite a bit of okay where where can you get the best out of people and where do you get the least out of people even if it feels like you're doing a great job but uh okay we've got two la two questions for you jeff um remaining tell me three stories that have helped shape who you've become and in your life they could be personal professional but three stories that have helped shape who you've become is the second to last question um and maybe we've mentioned some of them know, in the conversation. I, yeah, I think I did. I there, you know, I was in the fifth grade, and uh, there was a, like a costume um, contest or something that that I won. This was like you know, you can imagine it's a long time ago with a very unacceptable thing nowadays. But I made a, um, I took a box and put it put like a hole in it so I could get in, and my arms were sticking out. I made it into a cigarette machine. So it had like packs of cigarettes and little knobs and stuff, mm -hmm. which was kind of funny in those days. It's hilarious now. I mean, it's stupid, but it was kind of funny even then. And and there was a little bit of like um, creativity to it that was really fun. And and when it was accepted and people laughed at it, I learned that they were laughing at it, which was the idea and not at me. You know, mm -hmm. they, they were laughing at something bigger that I'd created. They weren't making fun of me because, you know, as a as a creative person, it's easy to take it in and go. They didn't like my painting, so they don't like me. You, you got to be able to like you got to be able to separate those things. And that was actually really a, a good thing that it was a package, you know, that was me and the painting, me and the cigarette machine mm -hmm. <laughs> that they were laughing at and that that was good. You know, yeah, um, validation to win so, the contest. So, and, and, and everybody has a teacher or something that they remember gave them or a boss that gave them some validation, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that that I, I had that happen with an English teacher that said I had written something that was good and made me read it to the whole class. You know, that oh, kind of cool. thing sticks with you for your life. If you're lucky enough to have that happen to you. Mm -hmm. Um. It, it really stays with you and starts to make you think, well, I'm that kind of person, you know, I'm that kind of person. I, I, I won and, a little journal, uh, drawing contest to, to illustrate our phone directory of our elementary school when I was like seven. And yeah, it's one of the most singular moments of, of my life. Isn't like, it? Oh, I not only, you know, had a, um, an interest in doing this, but the validation that, oh, I'm, I might be okay at this, um, that's huge. Yeah. I, and I had a, so when I got that first job at the agency that I said wasn't all that great an agency, the creative director there was actually a very smart guy from New York named Stu Hyatt, who had worked at great agency in New York, um, Doyle Dane Bernbach. And, um, but he, you know, he was, he was at the end of his career. I don't think he really gave a shit about whether the, the work that we did was all that great. But he was actually a very astute character and had been in a lot of rooms. And I remember doing a new business pitch when I was very, boy, I don't, I'd only been there for a year or two or a year maybe. And they put me in like a room with a whole bunch of like pretty heavy characters and gave me some role to present. So I presented it and he came up to me after it was over and he said, that was great. I, and I said, I was nervous as hell. And he said, no, it was great. You're doing things you don't even know you're doing. And I thought, mm. and that was very validating in a good way, you know, like positive, positive way. It gave me some more confidence to do it again and kind of be myself, like myself was enough. And right. if you're lucky enough to have that happen, it's really good, you know, Shit, yourself is enough. Yeah, that is a really, really impactful I don't know if there's any more impactful form of validation than you're good at this thing that it would be hard to even tell you why you're good at it. You're like, you're going with nature and you're excellent going with with, it, within it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to fight nature? No. Yeah. Right. Right. 
which is so, I mean, that's 99% of people's careers is fighting nature. And, and that's then, right. People and, spend way too much time fighting nature. Right. You're so right. And that's kind of what I meant when I was talking about younger people accepting themselves. If you're shy, like be the shy person. It's fine. Just know that that's you, you know, mm-hmm. that that's, that that's you and, you know, make it charming or try to overcome it. If you think it's a real drawback, overcome it, you know? Right. Um, but I, I think it's, like it, my, it, my, it, it's still important for that shy person to build that rapport. Cause it's just, if you're going to build anything of significance, it requires uh, countless relationships, but maybe, yeah, instead of getting time in your office, they record uh, a video of what they've created and they do it six times to get it right and send that over and then yeah the boss can be like holy shit that was really cool thank you for sharing it doesn't have to be well i guess it's exactly what you're saying it's find your own voice your own path and lean find your own way of doing things because you know if somebody came to me and said here's my idea i made a video of it i would watch that video in a minute i mean that's an awesome way to present something you know think about yourself that way Mm. try to be expansive enough to think that make a video, somebody's going to watch it. You know, I mean, that's a wonderful realization to figure that out. You know, I mean, I, I remember, I remember playing the guitar and singing a song at a presentation and, and going, you know, this is terrible. But as I did it, I realized that the very act of doing it was actually gaining, earning points. Mm -hmm. It was getting getting me points just because I had the nerve to do it. You know, right. it's not because I'm good at it. It's and, and, and in the years since then, it was at Dryer's Ice Cream in California. In the years since then, I've seen executives from Dryer's and they've gone, I just remember you playing that guitar. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like just sometimes. Oh, and, and, and that brings up another thing. A lot of times we worry about how perfect our technological presentations are and all the slides are lined up in the PowerPoint or the the keynote is perfect and so on. Um, up to a point, people don't mind things screwing up. They make you a human. Like, mm-hmm. oh, this is the wrong slide. You know, I mean, I should have had this slide in here. You just own it. I have this is the wrong slide. I'm so sorry. Fix it. You got to fix it in a reasonable amount of time. You can't just end the presentations there and have people like you. But a little bit of screwing up kind of makes you human. And right. you shouldn't you shouldn't let it sidetrack you too much. And so, yeah, you know? and sometimes acknowledging it makes you uh, just extremely likable, right? It's extremely likable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're oh, no, like us. Yeah. Right. We the, all screw up. Well, and and actually, it's one of my. Um, it's happening right now. Uh, such a universal moment. Um, there's a plane flying overhead, and my producer, who's a, a podcast producer on some amazing podcasts, he just said, "When that's happening, um, just call it out." Like if it's a loud noise in the microphone, just call it out and you don't need to cut it out. You don't need to say, Hey, let's wait a second. Just be like, yeah, there's a loud ass, uh, plane flying. Yeah. yeah. Flying I, I, my dog, my dog was about to start barking a little while back and I almost had to call it out. Maybe you heard it begin. I almost had yeah. to call, acknowledge it. Yeah. But good. Good. It's, okay. <laughs> last question for you, Jeff. I've loved this, uh, this conversation. I wish we could have touched on so many other things. Um, and for listeners, just stay tuned for, uh, we'll put it in the show notes of, of the different, uh, different commercials that are about to be, you know, hitting every TV cool. airwave with the Super Bowl that you guys are behind. Um, it's, you know, Pepsi Doritos. Um, there's who, yeah, who, who Sam, Adams, Sam Adams, Cheetos, Doritos. Cheetos. Rockstar and um, something else. It's so it's awful. It's, yeah, it is so <laughs> so killer. Um, congratulations on building an agency that has not just one of these, but so many you Thank can't you. even remember all all five. The um, the <laughs> last last question I have for you, Jeff, is what's something you think a lot about? You know, today, this week, this past year, something maybe it's something you've thought about a lot about for. 50 years that you rarely ever get a chance to talk about, um, you know, it doesn't have to be taboo. It just maybe just doesn't come up in conversation, but something that takes up a lot of mind share within you that, um, that you rarely get a chance to talk about. Um, I, I talk a lot about the acceptability of humor 
I think weirdly, like what, what is acceptable to be funny with, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of, for another project, I've been doing a lot of research about Andy Warhol, who was a guy who was very accepting of people around him. He had all these weirdos around him and, you know, he would have these people come into his life and, and he made movies by just turning the camera on and going, let's make a movie. I don't know. Let's make it about cowboys or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the movies are terrible. They just turn the camera on and start playing it. But there was some sort of liberation to the lack of judgment that came into that. And, and a lot of humor is that it's like thinking of something and just blurting it out, you know, because we all think of things that are really naughty to say. Mm -hmm. And the threshold of naughtiness, I think, should be should be lowered. I think we should be allowed to say more of those things than we usually say. And, and oftentimes that's where humor comes from, you know. And so I, th I think about, you know, what's acceptable and sometimes overstepping that. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's uh, it's definitely a, a very interesting thing about sharing life with people, you know, like. How do you share life? One of one way is to not be afraid to talk about that stuff. And humor is that it's a way to talk about things that you might not otherwise talk about. Yeah. I know that Oppenheimer has a quote of uh, humor is the only divine quality that men possess. And, and I, I definitely agree with, with, I love, uh, I mean, a long life of laughter. It's, it's hard to beat that definition of, of a great life. What do you feel like it's waned over time? what is acceptable or, or how present humor is in our lives? I think it gets policed a lot more now, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and it's not because I'm one of those like, you know, politically correct people or something um, or afraid of politically correct. I'm just, I think that sometimes we over time and certainly maybe even with age up to a point, I think may, when you think about it, maybe your lifetime, actually you lose some of your inhibitions to say shit and then you kind of reach you reach a plateau where you go through life and go okay this is me i kind of i'm about this funny and then near the end of your life it's like fuck it and you'll say anything <laughs> right Grand grandparents are known for being hilarious yeah yeah it's yeah it's that curve well to be a, oh go ahead go ahead cognizant. no just be cognizant of where you are on the curve it's good yeah, to keep that curve going high. I feel like with with all of us having microphones, um, I mean, you see it in every social media platform. Just the the humor in them. Something like Twitter, for example. The more public, the more uh, the bigger the microphone. Instagram, maybe not so much because it you can restrict your account much more and and it's visual. But it's it it does feel like the the more microphones we're given with different platforms, the more audience that's out there there's this gravitational pull to only uh, towards uh, seriousness or a uh, gravitational pull towards we need to um, change the world with this microphone. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not living up to my you know, potential or, or full uh, responsibility. And I think, um, well, you touched on it with that sense of humor. It's, it's like the jester is the one that, that is the only one able to say the truth to the king. And, and we have to uh, be able to talk about uh, things. And, and if we well, can, and it wrap can, it it can bring, yeah. it can bring people together too. Right. I mean, having a, having a sense of humor that does not ridicule, but is a sense of humor actually, I think is a way for people who totally are different ends of the political spectrum to talk to each other. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it is not embraced enough. I think we don't we don't embrace it enough. It's like you said, we are just too serious and too quick, too quick to be serious. You know, we're too quick to get serious. Yeah. Well, I um, I have loved this conversation, Jeff. Thank you so much for the generosity of time. It was fun, man. And, and insight. Yeah. Um, to talk about laughs. That was there were some awesome laughs in there um, amongst all of the wisdom. Where can people find out about you and Goodby Silverstein Partners? Where where should people go online? Well, you can go to goodbysilverstein.com, of course. Um, you can write to me if you want. It's uh, Jeff underscore Goodby at gspsf.com. Goodby Silverstein Partners, San Francisco.com. Um, 
My partner and I did a master class. You can pay. Yes, I'm going to mention that in the intro. Master class. Yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to mention uh, that in the intro. Uh, it's <laughs> that that really obviously uh, canonized you. Uh, that sanctification of why I was so excited to get you on to the podcast. Um, well, yeah, it's topics. funny. It makes you think about your life, which is you know something you don't do on the whole. It makes you think. You know, it makes you think. Do you really know anything? <laughs> It does uh, on that on Which that is, note. It's a good exercise. On that note, do you feel with all of the experience and and career success you had, yeah, it, is it somewhat surprising um, to ask yourself that question? No, it's it's uh, it, it's really a good thing to do from time to time to ask ourselves that question. You know, like. Uh, I think what you really learn in the course of things is that you know less than you thought you did. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and, and you, you value the things you're pretty sure about, you know, out of curiosity, when, it was there a point in time when you had like a, the absolute pinnacle of you thinking you knew a lot. Or is that a, consistent well, my dad threat? would say, it, my dad would say it was when I was about 18. Yeah. <laughs> But, and then it's been downhill since then. <laughs> yeah. The more I've advised, I think I uh, invest in, have invested and advised about 80 startups. The more that I do it, the more that I build, built for, uh, the more I'm like, I don't know if I can provide any, any real insight into this conversation, but happy to try to help. Uh, but when I was building my first and second startup, God, I remember being like, it, the, I thought my mind was just... It was, it was, everything was airtight in any viewpoint I, I, yeah. I had. Uh, I now, got it. I got it nailed. So loose now. Yeah. Well, that's what you learn. You learn, you learn, you learn to, you learn when to talk and when not to talk a little bit more. Amen. I'm, for sure. I'm, I'm still learning. But that. you know, I mean, it's great that you're doing this podcast. I think it's a public service in a great way. I'm sure that people really uh, honor and, um, and appreciate the stuff that you're getting across. Well, I mean, I, this kind of thing can be incredibly empowering and, um, and motivating, you know, make, make, make you want to get up in the morning. Well, which it's is great for all of us inter interviewing heroes. And by the way, for listeners, I just cold email, we cold me emailed you and, and you agreed to do the podcast. So you really do reply to emails. Um, and it's a, uh, it is, yeah, that's the that is the motivation behind the podcast is having the I think interviews as a medium is just so interesting and and um, and new and recent. You know, a hundred years ago, no, you had it's a, great. A, a newspaper article, but you didn't have this type of free form, follow little breadcrumbs in different directions type of interviews with with um, which is fun. Great minds that you know you've probably forgotten all that you've learned uh, to the last question that or the last topic we touched on. You with that humility, and yet you fall it down a path. And I, I the hope is that a listener. Um, but and by the way, I I don't just go on any old podcast when you and when you cold called me cold wrote to me. I looked you up. <laughs> you know, checked it out and saw that this thing was great. So oh. congratulations. Well, thank you, Jeff. I yeah. hope to have you on. Uh, we didn't even get to all of your, uh, the award-winning work like Got Milk. We didn't get to so many different things, but um, I couldn't, couldn't be more appreciative of the time that you did share today and all the insight that Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Us. It was good. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, man. Congratulations. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you for joining. All right. We'll have you for round have two fun. sometime soon. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. All right. Tell me how it's going. Bye-bye.